right, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter number 16, uh, where we will spend our time of worship uh, in through the preaching word of the Lord. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13. Matthew 16, verse number 13 uh, is where we'll spend uh, our time. Uh, you know, as this uh, incident happened, I was uh, uh, immediately drawn to this passage. I felt the Lord just speak to me. And just remind me of uh, this passage of scripture. And uh, I, I think it's also a wonderful passage of scripture to remind us of our task as we move into this upcoming year of ministry uh, to uh, remind ourselves that we are indeed on the winning side. <clears throat> so Matthew chapter 16 is where we'll spend our time uh, speaking and preaching on this particular topic. Uh, the book of Matthew, of course, is written by the uh, former tax collector, the one who was working for the state, working for the uh, empire, if you will. And uh, because of his uh, conversion moment, he was able to, in many respects, uh, eschew his way and follow in a very uh, intentional and important way the way of Jesus. So we're picking up the gospel according to Matthew, writing to a Jewish audience, primarily helping to remind them that Jesus, the one who has come, is indeed the Messiah, the one that has been promised to take away the sins of the world, the one that has been promised uh, to have uh, an upside-down effect on the, the way of the world and, and turn it right side up. This Jesus is indeed the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, verse 13, the word of the Lord says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus asked them, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the son of the living God. Oh, verse 17, Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. So whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. What a wonderful passage of scripture that we've read today. Uh, so yes, I want to speak simply from the topic uh, we are on the winning side, on the winning side. Come on, let's pray and invite the power of the Lord to be here with us in the name of Jesus. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And certainly we ask you to Bless me as your preacher. I pray that you will hide me behind your cross and let the anointing of God that makes preaching and teaching easy may it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Yes, we are on the winning side. Just type that in the chat and just remind yourself, tell yourself, I am on the winning side. Say that to yourself, I am on the winning side. Tell that to one of your favorite uh, uh, people of the way in the chat. Just put their name in there and tell them, hey, I am on the winning side. Encourage them and tell them, hey, you are on the winning side. We are on the winning side. Now, obviously, the, the, the events of this week uh, have reminded all of us of the reality that evil is not only real, but evil is at work among us. And the burning of our church is uh, another example of the 
centuries-long legacy of white supremacy and anti-black racism that runs without much abatement in the world. Certainly, many of us who are victimized by this kind of racial hierarchy, hatred, and animus can feel it in all kinds of different ways. Sometimes we feel it in our workplace. Sometimes we feel it as we go in and out of stores. Sometimes we feel it as we are playing at the park. Uh, sometimes we feel it with our children. Even yesterday, my brother uh, had to uh, 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 defend his daughter, my niece, because the, the place of her employment in and out Burger on East, in East Oakland uh, was giving her hassle because of her hair not fitting inside of a hat uh, per their supposed regulations. And it's so frustrating <clears throat> that we experience these kinds of, of, of racialized aggressions even when we pass laws to ensure that people can't treat us with such disregard and disrespect. I mean, we organize, y'all know here at The Way, we're just not a, a talking church, we are acting church. Somebody say amen, right? We act, we, we don't just complain, we act. And, and we helped to pass the Crown Act, which was intended to ensure that black women, in particular, do not have to have their hair trivialized on the work site. And all of you who are working in a, in a, in a, in a business or for an employer uh, in the state of California, we were the first state to pass this in 2019, where they can't discriminate against you because of your hairstyle, as, as Ben powerfully says, because uh, black women's hair uh, grows towards the sun. My God, today, I said, come on, Ben. Amen. It doesn't grow towards the earth. It grows towards the sun. And because of that, uh, we should not be asking black women or black people to diminish ourselves to fit inside some kind of arbitrary uh, value system that is only uh, elevated because of power and domination. It is not elevated because of uh, there's some inherent value in, in the Eurocentric way of being in the world. And so even as we deal with these somewhat, folks will say, benign responses, we still have to deal with the very malignant and dangerous responses of arson and burning of churches. And, and I put this photo up because I want you to appreciate that this is a legacy of several hundred years worth of damage done to black churches all across the South and all across the North and the Midwest and even here in the state of California where we see buildings being burned. Put that picture up for me. Uh, buildings being burned and, and people having to deal with the, the, the aftermath of what do you do when the place where the house of worship is designated by the people is set on fire by individuals that have some animus. And I want you to know, people of the way, that uh, it is in, indeed a fact that our church now joins a legacy of these kinds of actions done against a house of worship that would dare proclaim Jesus to be Lord, Jesus to be the fighter and the liberator of both our soul and our bodies. Arson is considered uh, an act against empty churches because of it being a soft target, most folks say. And it is done uh, to uh, communicate racial hatred and prejudice against certain religions or religious beliefs. It's done as a part of a sectarian campaign of communal violence. And it is often done anonymously to register dissent or anti-religious sentiment. And I want you to appreciate that this was so significant in the United States that in 1996, due to a sharp uprising of church burnings, 
they had to pass a congressional act that's only 15 years ago called the Church Arson Act of 1996 due to the sharp rise of small black churches being burned in the South. And, and it's not also a, 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 a coincidence that, that very few church burnings in this contemporary moment meet the threshold of a hate crime set by law enforcement authorities. Why? Because many times they can't reach the threshold of evidence of who did it and why they did it. When you take a look at even the way uh, they claim to have investigated our incident, uh, I was told that the police chief and the fire chief were not even notified by their fire fighters or their police officers until after I contacted the city to ask them how come no one had been in touch. That the folks who came out to investigate did not even send it up the pipeline, so to speak, because they didn't feel like, I guess, it was a significant thing. And so they literally did not start much investigation until a full day and a half later. So you can imagine, you know, that once something like this happens, you know, the evidence needs to be gathered right quickly in order to be able to uh, have a meaningful investigation. And so because of the lackadaisical responses to black pain and black terror, uh, we often are then forced to be gaslit in a way to make us believe that this just happens to be another coincidence. It's just a coincidence that we raise the Black Lives Matter uh, banner on the front of our congregational building, and then 12 hours later, someone's burning fires into our trash cans adjacent to the building of our church. It's just a coincidence. Have you ever had someone make you feel like the continuous violations in your life are single standalone coincidences? <laughs> Maybe in your job, maybe with your family member, and, and, and they try to make you believe that you're the crazy one. You're the one who's just making things up as we go along. No, I want you to know that if you have an episode uh, that continues to happen over and over again, how many of you know in television, many episodes together is a series? <laughs> Amen. And, and, and when you when you have uh, 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 many episodes that make up seasons, then you have all kinds of series of events. And I want you to know that much of what we've been experiencing has a series of 300 years of consistent racial animus towards certain groups and people. And you and I must, in the face of this opposition, remind ourselves that we still are on the winning side. Why? Because we're joining a long legacy of individuals who have had to endure such persecution and trial. Just this week, we laid to rest, literally on the same day we had our press conference, the official homegoing celebration of John Lewis, who was uh, buried and eulogized by our dear friend, uh, Raphael Warnock, Pastor Raphael Warnock of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, where John Lewis was an active and faithful member. Uh, we were reminded that John Lewis continued to tell us, even as he transitioned to glory, he says that it's important for you and I to stay in trouble and keep getting into good trouble. I want you to know that this is the legacy that we have as followers of Jesus in this moment. That these attacks on our not just building, but the attacks even in your life is a response to you being on the progress and the process and the journey towards winning God's great favor and plans for our future. I want you to know, child of God, that these attacks are not just essentialized in the burning of our buildings, but there are many ways that violence visit us. I love Dr. Uh, Coretta Scott King, who reminded us that uh, starving a child is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Punishing a mother and her family is violence. 
Discrimination against a working person is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. Ignoring medical need is violence. Contempt for poverty is violence. You and I must keep reminding ourselves that the violence that we experience both personal, communal, social, and systemically are all attacks on us because we are winning. I want you to tell that to yourself. I am winning. We are winning. I know it may not feel that way, but I want you to know, child of God, that we are on the winning side. You are on the winning side. And because of that truth, we cannot lose hope. Because when we lose hope, then hopelessness is as deadly as a bullet. And you and I cannot allow the hopelessness that often these acts of terror try to seed in your heart to move you off your spot of confidence that God is indeed still fighting for us. Yes, God is fighting for you. Amen. God is giving you what you need in order to stand up tall in the face of opposition and not cower and not retreat and not backslide. God wants you to put your feet in the ground, all ten toes down. Amen. As, as the prophet Nipsey said, and move forward because we are on the winning side. This is why I, I find this passage to be so important because Jesus takes his disciples to a region known as Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi, in the, 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 the uh, geographic kind of archaeological uh, background of, of Palestine, Judea, uh, uh, Galilee, Israel, the Roman Empire, whichever term you want to use of that day, Caesarea Philippi was one of the places where Jews were the most feeling out of place and out of sorts. Caesarea Philippi was a foreign place. It was an uncomfortable place. It was a place that was 25 miles from the religious communities of Galilee where you found Jews of practicing the Torah with great faithfulness. And it was in this place called Caesarea Philippi that a former king has started to build idols and, 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 and merge their religious practices with other kind of what they would call fertility practices of the Greek uh, 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 gods. And, 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 and in that, in that uh, territory, you found that Herod Philip, who rebuilt the city uh, after many years of Roman rule, he named the city after himself. And this particular place where they, they are thought that Jesus brought them was a cave in Caesarea Philippi. And this cave was a place that was a shrine built to the, the Greek god named Pan, who was, uh, in many respects, one of the fertility gods where they believed this gate, this cave, was a, a pathway to the underworld. It was a place where literally the practices were against that which they knew to be true. And it is in that place that Jesus purposely leads his disciples. And when he gets there to the cave of Philippi, that is thought to be the gates of hell, Jesus steps back and he asks them, who do people say I am? Woo, I want you to, to understand, child of God, that oftentimes Jesus leads us into places of discomfort. Jesus allows us to, through the course of our life, engage and interact with incidents and moments that feel like we are being put out of our comfort zone. And in the middle of those moments, we are then asked by the Lord to offer our testimony and our confession. Who do people say that I am? And I want you to know, child of God, that this is why you and I being on the winning side must be a consistent reminder. Because when you are on enemy territory, when you are the away team in a basketball, football, baseball game uh, in a more kind of normal environment, you know that the crowd is cheering against you. Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody today. The crowd, when you make a mistake, the crowd jeers you. 
When you make a mistake, the crowd throws up signs to tease you, to try to rustle your feathers and make you think twice about that which you have practiced time and time again. But I want you to know that there's only a few players on the team that are able to do well when they are on a foreign environment. Sometimes they call them, you know, you got your home team players. You got people, you know, if they on the home court, they, man, they don't have a problem hitting a three with a contested hand. They don't have a problem, amen, uh, running and catching a football. They don't have a problem hitting the ball because everybody's cheering their name and they are, are calling out for their success. But I believe the way has a few folks out here who are comfortable being in a foreign place. We are comfortable being on some territory where we know the enemy is coming against us and it is in that moment when the enemy comes against us God wants you and I to answer the question who who do you believe that I am and that's the first point then I want you to believe about us being on the winning side that we are on the winning side why because we trust the rock on which we stand somebody holler I trust the rock Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And some were comparing him to uh, other prophets and some were comparing him to other individuals. And then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus response to him is flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but on this rock, I will build my church. What is that rock? The rock is your confession that you must trust the rock, trust the confession that you and I have made about who Jesus is. Somebody type in there, trust the rock, trust the rock, trust the rock, trust the confession that you have made about who Jesus is. And who Jesus is, is to the way and to so many is why we put that banner up on our church. It's why we make the confession week to week and day to day and hour to hour and moment to moment that there are some who proclaim Jesus to be a very narrow savior that Jesus is only concerned about the saving of your your soul but don't care about your body don't care about your relationships don't care about the things that concern you but I want you to know that the confession the rock of which we stand is an all-encompassing Jesus it is a Jesus who declares that I am here with you. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. I am the gate that no one can shut. I am the door. Jesus says in many ways, I am or I will be whatever you need me to be. This is the rock on which we stand. Your confession is the rock. And I want you, child of God, to tell yourself that I have a confession of Jesus that I can trust. And that confession of who Jesus is, is the foundation that cannot be shaken. Yes. What you say and confess about Jesus is the foundation that cannot be shaken. Our core values as a church defines what we say and what we believe about Jesus. Yes, Jesus has an impact that makes us have a welcoming and inclusive home-like atmosphere for whosoever will let them come. That is our confession. Our confession, the rock of our confession reminds us that Jesus has an impact on our spirituality. That is our confession. Our confession reminds us that there is a process of de-churchifying, decolonizing, letting go of some things that have attached themselves to our faith that need not be the essence of how we follow Jesus in the world. That is our confession. And certainly our confession reminds us that we are a church and a people who loves righteousness and justice and that the two are inextricably linked. That is our confession.
And so anyone that has a problem with us affirming the, the dignity and the humanity and the lives of black folk and marginalized folk, then you must not understand that we trust the rock that our church is built on. And we will not be deterred because some folk get uncomfortable or are uneasy. All I want you to tell yourself is whenever people push back against you and against your confession, guess what? It's because they are the, the, the agitators and you are on their home court. But child of God, how many of you have ever seen a champion go into somebody else's house and secure a championship secure a victory in spite of what what court they're playing on they know that I'm coming in here because I got somebody that will fight for me I got a better coach I got a better point guard I got a better shooting guard I got a better power forward I got a better center I got a better quarterback I got a better offensive lineman I got a better running back a better wide receiver I got a better pitcher I got a better catcher I got a better skipper whatever team I'm playing on as long as God is with us we are on the winning side I wish I could tell somebody today that we are are on the winning side so the question I want you to ask yourself does your confession about Jesus encompass the kind of rock you need in this season or must you learn to trust the rock a little bit more I want you to think about this question does your confession about Jesus encompass the kind of rock you need in this season is the rock the confession that you have made not adequate for the enemies that are coming against you some of us need to ask God Lord help me to learn to trust the rock more because the more you trust the proclamation that Jesus is the Christ that Jesus is Lord that Jesus is Messiah that Jesus is the way out of no way that Jesus is the bridge over troubled water that Jesus is your battle axe that Jesus is your peace that Jesus is your healer that Jesus is your victory that Jesus is everything you need the more you learn to trust it how many of you know there ain't no hell that the devil could bring your way that will move you off your confession? And I believe today, folks ask me, Pastor Mike, how do you stay so, 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 so uh, solid in this time? I tell them, believe me, there are some moments where I start to, I start to, you know, get, get caught up in the wind. But because I have a rock that I stand on. Amen. All I can do is sway a little bit. Amen. All I can do is sway. But I ain't moving off this rock now. And I don't want you to move off the rock. The second thing that I want you to know that you should uh, remind yourself uh, because we're on the winning side, stay on offense. Huh, yeah, tell, tell the people in the chat, we got to stay on offense. Tell the folk in your family, we got to stay on offense. The Bible declares, Jesus said it, that the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. What does this mean? Well, again, I want you to use your imagination. Jesus talking to the disciples at this cave that is intended to be the gateway into the, the netherworld, the underworld, the, the place where, where, where literally the, 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 the demonic forces and, and the, the pagan gods are living. Jesus is telling them, listen, I want you to believe, child of God, that this gate right here requires you you to be on offense against it. Sometimes we read this, this scripture and people think that the gates of hell are on offense on us. But no. Jesus is telling them, I want you to bum rush the gates of hell. Woo. Jesus is telling you that the gates of hell that were a defensive structure in the ancient world, the gates of hell were the things that were intended to keep an enemy out. Jesus is saying that child of God, I want to unleash you to storm some gates of hell that have set up a defense in your life. 
And can you imagine what it would look like, child of God, if you heard the words of Jesus ringing in your ear, the kind of confidence that you and I would have when the enemy is setting up gates of hell to keep you out from that which God has called you to take dominion over. And God is telling you, I'm not asking you to be on the defensive. I'm asking you to be on the offense. Stay on the offense, child of God, in this season. Don't get defensive. Don't start cowering and, and falling back into a posture of defensiveness. No, it's time for some of us to bum rush some gates of hell in our families. Bum rush some gates of hell on your job. Bum rush some gates of hell related to your children. The enemy has set up some gates of hell and the enemy is trying to intimidate you and make you think that you just have to take it and you just have to wait. But I hear God saying to somebody today, what gates of hell are you being asked to storm? What gates of hell are you being asked to bum rush? How can you stay on the offensive? I know that you're fighting against injustice. I know that you're trying to keep your family together. I know that you're trying to keep your health in a situation of sustainability. I hear God saying, but I've given you some practices. I've given you some practices uh, that can help you bum rush these things in your life. Uh, God says, I've given you some tools like prayer. Uh, I dare you this week to bum rush the gates of hell in your life uh, by pulling together some daily prayer time. Uh, and when you're on your knees, uh, I dare you to write some names down, uh, some situations that you need God to give you the strength to bum rush. Uh, I dare you to look at the circumstances on your job, in your finances. Write them things on down and tell the Lord, Lord, I need your strength to help me bum rush some gates of hell. We already doing the justice work, but I dare you to double on down on it. Don't you get tired. Don't you shrink. But this week, write down some justice situations, some situations that need to be bum rushed. It may be patriarchy. It may be racism. It may be economic exploitation. It may be transphobia. It may be homophobia. It may be domestic violence. But whatever it is, I dare you to ask God, since I am on the winning side, it's time for me to storm some of these gates of hell. I refuse to take a step back when God tells me I got to keep moving forward. I'm moving forward to the gates of hell. They don't know what's coming, but I am on the winning side. I got a team backing me up, and the name of the team is the Way Christian Center, the host of heaven, the body of Christ, the church of the living. God. It's on my side. That's why we can't lose. You can try to burn the building. But like Jesus said, burn this temple down. And in three days, it will rise again. We got to rise because we are the people that God has called in this day. We are on the winning side. Shout hallelujah. So ask yourself this week, what gates of hell need storming in your life? Ask yourself, don't settle for things as they are. When God is saying, I've given you the opportunity to imagine the world yet unseen. Jesus said to his disciples, listen, everything that you're saying right now about me being the Christ, the son of the living God. Me being Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. But the Father in heaven has revealed it. What does that mean? There's some revelation, continuous revelation that God wants to give to we the people of the way. We the people of God look for the revelation. 
Look for it. Don't allow what you see with your eyes to be the final declaration of what is true. But I am looking for the revelation of God. That which cannot be revealed by flesh and blood. I want you to know that God wants to give you and I encounters that keep telling us that there is more at work than what we see. Do I have anybody that believes that today? That there is more at work in us than what we can see. And when you got some folks on your side that can see what other people can't see. How many know you want to win inside? Ain't nothing better being around some folk who look at the same evidence that everybody else sees, but they can somehow come out with a winning strategy. That is who we are as God's people in this day and in this moment. So as we bear witness to this today, I want you, child of God, to keep reminding yourself we are on the winning side. We, as God's people, are on the winning side. And God has taken us at times. I mean, COVID is our Caesarea Philippi. White supremacy is our Caesarea Philippi. The arson against our building, Caesarea Philippi. The health challenges, the financial challenges, All of us are facing a different Caesarea Philippi, a foreign place where we are being asked, what do we believe about God? And I want you to know your confession can grow. It doesn't have to stay in a place of minimal belief. But every moment is an opportunity for an expanded faith. Just take a few moments and say, God, expand my faith. Expand my confession. Help me, Lord, to see and to know. As soon as I stop worrying, worrying how the story ends, when I let go and I let God, oh, I let God have God's way. When I let go and I let God, oh, I let God have God's way. God, I pray for every person, Lord God, who is listening on this holy day of worship, this day, Lord God, where we gather to be reminded of your faithfulness, but also to be encouraged through the sacramental practice of the body and the blood of Jesus being remembered through Eucharist. Remind us that we are on the winning side. Remind us that, God, we have a team, Lord God. Hallelujah. We are not alone. We are not isolated. But, God, we have some folks that are fighting for us. And some of those we don't even know we're seeing. Just like the neighbor that put the fire out. There are people around us that we don't even know that are fighting for us because we're on the winning side. Lord, just like our ancestors, Lord God, had to endure hardness and hardship. God, so will we endure. Whether that hardness or hardship, Lord God, is, is, is the pandemic of this coronavirus. God, we will endure it. Lord God, whether it is the betrayal of our loved ones, we will endure it. Whether it is the depression or the, the, the loneliness or the isolation, Lord God, the hopelessness that sets in. We're on the winning side, so we will endure it. Whether it is the economic instability of this season, we will endure it. Whether it is the attacks on our character, on our mission, on our calling, we will endure it. Why? Because we're on the winning side and our confession secures victory for us. The rock on which we stand secures victory for us. So we will stand on this rock. The Christ, the rock of Christ, we stand all other ground. Is sinking sand. So I pray for the blessings of God to be at work in every family, every person that is a part of our fellowship, a part of our family, a part of our community, and even to other houses of worship, other churches, Lord God, that are sticking their necks up in a moment where we see, 
Lord God, fascism and authoritarianism and anti-black racism, Lord God, and all of the attacks of the on marginalized people ramping up. I pray, God, that we will continue to have courage to stick our necks, Lord God, to stick our heads up, knowing, Lord, that you fight for us. And Lord, we say thank you.